Hey Future Unnaturalists, I'm Emily. And I'm Andy. And we are the hosts of Unnatural, a true crime podcast. Each week, we'll dive into some of the most unnerving crimes that this unnatural world has to offer. Listen for Unnatural on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. And remember, make good choices. And don't get got. Bye. Yeah, so Betsy didn't want to let her go, but she, you know, she did like, couldn't do anything at that point. Right. She was trying to protect her. So, of course, Chuck had to punish Linda at this point. So one day they were sitting at home and there was a knock at the front door. It was Linda's parents. Chuck told Linda, don't let them in yet. Before you open the door, take off your robe. She was like, Chuck, those are my parents. Don't do this to me. And Chuck said, take that robe off right now or I'll fucking rip it off you. And he said this while pointing the gun to her head. So she took off her robe. And he said, and now you open that fucking door. And if you let them know that this was my idea, I'm going to shoot you all. Do you think that he would actually kill someone? I don't know. He said he like bragged that he had done it before. I don't know that he would like blow up everybody at the house like that. Mm -hmm. But I mean... I don't know. She was scared. I think she thought that he he would, you know? Yeah. So Linda walked to the door naked and she opened it. And at first she was able to kind of like hide her body behind the door until they came in. And then when they got all the way in and she shut the door, they took one look at her and their jaws dropped. Her father turned deep red and her mom's mouth was like quivering. And it was a long, awkward moment. And then Chuck grabbed her robe and threw it at her and said, put on something decent. How could you answer the door like that? You should have something on in front of your father. Oh, oh, what an asshole. Yeah. And then they all like stood there awkwardly for a minute. And then Dorothy, Linda's mom, was finally like, what did you want? You called us. What did you want? And everybody was really confused because Linda didn't call her. So, apparently, Linda's father got a phone call from somebody who was crying and claiming to be Linda and begging him to come help her. Linda never figured out who it was that called him. She wondered if maybe it was, like, one of the other working girls trying to help her. And, like, oddly enough, the only person who sounds like her on the phone is Dorothy. So, Chuck was like, it must have been a prank call, and that was the end of that. And the parents went home. They just dropped it. Dorothy being Philip's wife. No, Dorothy is Linda's mom. Oh. Yeah. Oh, <gasps> so you, wait. So, I, I don't know. She sometimes, like, she she said in the book, like, I, I don't know if my mom would have called my dad just, just to come over and check on me, you know, and see what was going on, but I don't know. I don't. I think I think that was just a coincidence. It's just, a, you know. Yeah. But. I mean, if the girl was hysterical enough on the phone. It, oh, yeah, exactly. It, yeah. Anyway, they could. Yeah. Chuck and Linda started hanging out with a 19-year-old mechanic named Tom, who was one of their clients. They would stop at his auto shop frequently and hang out, and Chuck would always ask Tom about his old lady, Michelle. The only thing that Linda knew about Michelle was that she was also a sex worker and that she was a big freak. Chuck was always talking about, like, oh, you should do this thing Michelle does, and Chuck could only get off if there was some kind of pain or suffering happening, as we know, so there was something about Michelle like that Linda was picking up on must have been violent. Was she like a dominatrix? Basically. Basically, she, uh, there was one trick they talked about where she would, like, take shoelaces and tie them around a guy's balls or something. Oh. Uh, Yeah, it's fucking. Anyway, um, one day Chuck took Linda to a party at Michelle's house. Quote, unquote, party. (laughs) Party usually meant going to a place to watch strangers do sexual things to each other. But this party was actually meant as Linda's punishment for running off to Betsy's house. Another one? Another one. (laughs) Uh, Michelle was this really witchy looking lady. She was thin and tall and really pale, and she wore all black from her throat to her feet. Tom, her her boyfriend, the 19-year-old mechanic, he was also there, and there was a couple of other nicely dressed people. Michelle addressed Linda as if she was putting on a show, like like she was in a play or something. She told Linda, Linda, we don't want to punish you, but whatever we do, it's for your own good. 
We love you, Linda. We're so happy you've come back to us. It was okay. weird. Okay. Yeah, um, that's a little culty. Then she goes on, you were so cruel, Linda, to have forsaken those who love you. And then they made Linda get naked, and she got a really eerie feeling. They were, like, in candlelight, so everybody's face was dark, and it was just all really spooky. Michelle said, oh, don't be so frightened, my darling Linda. This is going to hurt me more than it hurts you. <gasps> oh, no. I don't know if you need it or if you saw it coming, but trigger warning. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> this is going to get really, really graphic again. Um, oh, dear God. So yeah, like you said, she is a dominatrix. Michelle tied Linda's hands together in front of her, and then she bent her over a footrest in front of a couch so that Linda was on her knees and her backside was exposed to everyone. Then she pulled out a whip and she started whipping her. And this was just little taps at first. Like, this was the foreplay. So, like, Linda knew, like, I'm supposed to cry out in pain and then be in pleasure, you know? I, I know, like, to do this before I get really in pain, you know? But she knew she had to pretend. She had to put on an act. After the whipping, Michelle took out a hair dryer, and she started it on warm, and she just kind of, like, ran it over her body and heating it up. And then she turned it up to hot, and she kind of started prodding her with it. And it was just, like, little taps, kind of like she knew just long how long enough to keep it there to make them react, but not to, like, squirm and freak out, you know? Oh, that's horrible. Because do you remember the old-ass hair dryers that literally yes, were like a they, coil? Yes, they were like a coil. That is exactly the way to put them. Oh, my God. Oh, yeah. And this was, what, 1969, 1970? Yeah. I can't so even it's imagine. straight up, like, stovetop. Oh, fuck that. <laughs> oh, my God. Um. So, anyway, she says that this was more painful than the whipping, but still not unbearable. And by the way, everybody at the party is just quietly watching. Even Chuck, of course. Yeah. Then Michelle tells Linda... The foreplay is coming to an end. You must prepare for the true punishment. She took out a dildo, and at first she penetrated her softly, and then she worked it into Linda's rectum. Of course, Linda had had anal sex before, but it was never consensual, and she never enjoyed it or wanted to do it. So it was kind of like, okay, let's just wait to get this over, over with. Whenever Chuck wanted to rape her or have her anally raped, she would start shrieking before the pain got too serious. And like I said, this these shrieks would be enough to make him climax and leave her alone before she was seriously hurt. But this is a woman with a dildo. The shrieks made no difference at all, like not even a little bit. Michelle didn't slow down the slightest bit. So Linda started trying to like adjust her body and find a position to like relax her muscles and just do anything she could to tolerate the pain. But then Michelle would go harder. And then Linda started screaming. Oh, God. She caught a glimpse of Chuck, and he was in a state of total excitement. He was just, like, watching Linda with, like, his jaw dropped and his eyes just, like, sparkling. And then he would look over at Michelle and just be, like, in complete admiration of her, you know? Michelle went faster and harder, and Linda panicked, thinking, like, this is it. This is too much. And she had the feeling that Michelle Michelle had slipped over the edge. And she started screaming, stop her. She's going to kill me. Michelle was clearly really excited, too. And she was now using both hands and breathing heavily and just stabbing the stildo into her. And then Linda felt blood gushing out of her right. <gasps> oh, my God. Finally, somebody spoke up. Some random guy got up and shouted, whoa, right there. What the hell are you doing to this chick? And Linda was shocked, but she was also kind of terrified that this guy was just going to be like, I'm out of here and leave. But he actually walked over to them and he grabbed Michelle's arm and he said, we're ending this right now. You fucking people are crazy. We're going to get this girl to a hospital right now. Michelle was like in a trance and she's just like breathing heavily and just like, yes, I suppose that is enough punishment. So the guy got ready to call the hospital, but Michelle was like, no, don't worry about it. I've got something to take care of this. It's nowhere near as serious as it looks. And Chuck was like, yeah, Linda loves this. She does this kind of shit all the time. Oh, my God, this poor girl. I wish you could see my face right now. I'm I know. It's like an utter shock. I, I know, you're, like, speechless. But, yeah, it's like we were saying, like, she knows her pain threshold. She knows what it's too far. And now at this point, like, it's out the window. And, and her who's got experience numbing herself, you know? So do you think that this woman was hypnotized? No. Okay. <laughs> no, <laughs> I don't know. She was a going. dominatrix who herself gets turned on 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 hurting that. people but i mean well, maybe oh it was specifically because it was like a small girl maybe she had never done that before you know maybe she was used to torturing men and maybe there was 
she says, hold on, there is something she says in it that she's like, oh, I just wish I didn't have to be, I wish, I just wish that you were a man. I would never give this kind of punishment to a girl, but you've been so cruel. Like, so I wonder if maybe she had never done that and she really got off on it. Huh. I don't know, but I don't think she was hypnotized. I think this was her thing. So yeah, uh, Michelle rubbed some kind of ointment on Linda and she said, sometimes the punishment will hurt a little, but it hurts me just as much. We just have to be sure that you don't run away again. Chuck took Linda home and told her you had to go and bleed and ruin everything. So she didn't go to the hospital? Um, she ended up having an infection and she ended up having to go see a doctor a few days later. The doctor advised her not to have any more anal sex because it would really, really hurt her. And she begged him, like, do not tell my husband that because if you tell him that it hurts me, he's going to keep doing it. But the doctor told him. Not only that, but this doctor who's like 50-something agreed to accept blowjobs for payment. Oh, my God. This woman had no chance, you know? Oh, my God. I am just in... Where do... We're not even done, you know? Why? So, so much <laughs> Where do these people come from? I, I don't understand. I am I sick. So, anyway, Linda was given a prescription for Percodan for the pain, and she told Chuck that Another? they were... Um, more. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe I don't know if that happened already or what. Maybe because, she well, what like, do you like? Maybe he was like on some um painkiller. She's like, you know, I like Percodan. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take some of that. But anyway, she told Chuck that they were like antibiotics for the for the uh infection. So like he could never like try to take them away from her, and she would also hide some so that if he did take them, it was only like half of them. Uh, but she started using them to cope with the pain, you know, and ev- and everything else. Yeah. And Chuck never knew that she was on painkiller. So did she actually become, like, an addict, do you think? I don't know. Um, I don't know. Maybe it's because even in her perspective, it would seem like such a minimal thing in the big picture. Right. Like, maybe she was an addict, but maybe in her perspective, like, no, this was my, this was a painkiller. Right, right. This right. was my antidepressant and painkiller and everything else. Because that makes me wonder if, like, those days when she was at her friend Betsy's house, if she was, like, detoxing. That's a good point. Maybe not, though. Yeah. Who knows? I bet she was still smoking weed and maybe drinking. So Chuck realized that he could pay any doctors with blowjobs. So he started, like, getting checkups with a dermatologist and an eye doctor and just, like, every doctor he could find an excuse to see. How desperate are these people? Well, he's like, well, now I, you know, I don't need money. It's basically like being rich, you know? He no longer needs money. So... One of these doctors, for some reason, had all these nurses on his staff who had really big, perky breasts. And it turns out that he was giving them silicone injections. Injection? Injections. Oh. So, I don't know if that is or was illegal. Do you know about this? No. I don't know if But I just or... think about, like, lip injections. And... Okay. So, anyway, at this time, it was illegal. So, for Linda, all she knows is, well, if it's illegal, it's usually because that's dangerous. You know? Right. It hasn't been proven to be safe yet. But anyway, Chuck was, like, amazing, and he made Linda get the silicone injections. And Linda says that she didn't want to do this because she was told that there was a really big drawback, which was that she could never breastfeed a child. And that was, even though it wasn't, like, anywhere in her immediate plan, that was, like, a dream of hers, to have babies and nurse them. But the decision wasn't hers, so she ended up getting it done. Meanwhile, Deep Throat was getting more and more famous, and the producer started meeting with Linda and Chuck to discuss a sequel. Linda started getting calls from Playboy and the such to do magazine spreads, and people started treating Linda like royalty. Chuck finally started to realize that she was a hot commodity and started treating her slightly less than garbage. Like, he used to send her into, like, gas stations to proposition, like, the guys at the counter, and he stopped doing that. He was like, yeah, that would actually hurt her. Her, her image now. You know? Yeah, because she looks like Now a- that she's in Playboy, you know? Yeah. One day after a photo shoot, Hugh Hefner invited Chuck and Linda back to his mansion for a buffet and a movie. Actually, he invited Linda, but Chuck wasn't going to let her go anywhere without him, so he ended up getting permission to come along, too. And Chuck actually took Linda to buy a nice dress for this occasion. Hmm. He picked it out, but he spent, like, $100 on it, which was, like, wow, you know? Like, so through all this, he never, like spoiled her or anything obviously oh, he no. treated her like shit he but... would like so let me give you one example he wouldn't take her shopping but he would buy her like three or four blouses that were all see-through and then make her wear them without a bra for her interviews oh that was the extent of his spoiling her 
He would never, they would never go to nice restaurants, even for himself, unless it was something like he had a meeting with Hugh Hefner. Or like he wanted Hunter to look something. good. Quote yeah, or he was invited. <laughs> so yeah, he's like, oh shit, we're going to a buffet at Hugh Hefner's? Yeah, we better go shopping, you know? Yeah. This was one time that he was like, we want to go back. <laughs> we want to look nice for this. After dinner, Hef pulled Linda aside, and he decided to talk to her about Deep Throat. And he apparently... He apparently told Linda that he was more interested in that one film that she had done with the dog. Hugh Hefner? Yeah. Okay. Sorry, I'm, I'm nodding. I, <laughs> I know. Um, I need to catch up on all of the... Uh, Inside Playboy? Yes. I do too. We can watch that together and do an episode on that together because it, it just seems overwhelming. Yeah, because I, I mean, knowing that he wants to watch her fuck a dog, now I'm curious what else he did. Uh, my ear so yes, uh, Hugh is like, yeah, I really like that dog film you did. According to Linda, he said, that was terrific. You know, we've tried that several times, try to get a girl and a dog together, but it's never worked out. And Chuck was like, oh, yeah, you know, it's tricky. Oh, my God. Hef went on and said, yeah, I'd really like to see that. And Chuck was like, oh, really? Well, that's no sweat for Linda. Oh, yeah, she's a dog expert. I mean, she did it once. You Hefner can't get anybody to do it. Oh. Anyway. Linda says that Chuck and Hef talked about sex with animals for a couple of hours, and that it was like watching a couple of kids talking about their toys on Christmas. Ew. Uh, Hef? So Chuck set it all up, and they brought their dog, Rufus, over to Hef's mansion. It's really funny. Like, she describes how they actually flew Rufus in and got him this little, like, doggy boarding suite. And she's like, I bet that dog was so confused to be flying into Beverly Hills like a celebrity like that. (laughs) And then taken to Hugh Hefner's house. <laughs> right. Chuck told Linda, this time hang in there and give it time. Like, we have to be patient. And, you know, Hugh Hefner must understand that. He must know that. So just give it time. Even if Rufus doesn't seem to want to do it, just wait it out. So Linda did exactly what Chuck told her. And she used her tricks of, like, slightly backing into Rufus to get him to back off of her. And they did this for what seemed like forever until Hef was like, you know what? Forget it. These things happen. <laughs> That's Rufus, like, hell yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Thanks for not raping me. (laughs) Yeah, bitch. Sorry. That was Jude, by the way. (laughs) Yeah, it definitely wasn't Rufus. (laughs) Poor Rufus, man. I really hope he went to a good home. Yeah. In Beverly Hills, but not to Hugh Hefner's place. Yeah, not to Hugh Hefner. Linda's getting more and more attention now. She's getting calls for, like, interviews and stuff. And she got an offer to write a book called Inside Linda Lovelace. This was, like, a porn pos- or, or, like, a, a sex-positive autobiography. However, again, this was the Linda Lovelace doll talking. Uh, this was all Chuck. All of this attention that Linda was, ga- was getting was kind of creating a small wall between her and Chuck that was just kind of getting bigger and bigger. So, um, right. So Linda became an author. And and like I said, this whole book even sounds like it was written by a fucking man who doesn't know what he's talking about. It's like the book, the whole book is like, I'm Linda Lovelace and I live for sex and I've been a chronic masturbator since age 12 and I love having sex on camera and I lost my virginity to the amazing Chuck Trainer and his fat rock like muscle tore into me like a battering ram. I've never come so fast in my life. Like it's all bullshit. (laughs) I bet not. Like the entire book. Is like written by a man trying to get it into the mind of a woman. Misogynistic. Yeah. Sorry. In 1976, though, Chuck admitted in an interview, I wrote the book Inside Linda Lovelace with another guy before Linda and I split up. I created the sex situations in it just as I created Linda Lovelace. That wouldn't be known until much later. So Linda was starting to get attention from all kinds of people, even celebrities. And one day, she and Chuck got a call from Sammy Davis Jr., who was apparently a huge fan of Deep Throat. He invited them over to hang out at his suite at the Waldorf Astoria, and Chuck told Linda that he expected something to happen between she and Sammy that night. But when they got there, his wife, Altavice, was there with him. They all hung out and they talked, but nothing sexual happened. Sammy continued inviting Chuck and Linda over to hang out, and he arranged the seating so that Linda was sitting next to him, and Chuck was next to Altavice. Hmm. Before long, Linda and Sammy started hooking up, but they wouldn't have just regular intercourse because Sammy considered that to be cheating on his wife. But oral sex was okay, and that's what he wanted. He wanted Linda to deep throat him. Of course he did. Of 
from Linda. It's like all she's good for. <sighs> she's like, I don't even like sucking dick. Why is that all Can we want to do? Can you imagine when it's like, you want to be an actress, and you, you're starting to meet all these people that are your idols, all these actors, and they're like, oh my god, I'd love to shake your hand. Linda Lovelace, I heard you give great blowjobs, you know? Like, right, yeah. Can you suck my I'm dick? So, yeah. Linda Lovelace, so nice to meet you. Can I you have beautiful blowjob? eyes. Yeah. <laughs> Altavise and Chuck hooked up too, and I think that was kind of the setup. But Altavise despised Chuck. She absolutely could not stand him. And she supposedly asked Sammy to find her somebody else. Ooh. To Linda, it seemed that Altavise wasn't into the orgies or the hookups as much as she as much either. And she just like participated in them to make her ha- her husband happy. But anyway, the four of them hooked up and they would switch it up. And sometimes Sammy and Chuck would make Linda and Altavise hook up for their own enjoyment. Sammy supposedly started to get pretty serious feelings about Linda. Hmm. One night, Altavise had gone out and it was just Linda, Chuck, and Sammy. And they were watching a porno movie together. And Linda was deep-throating Sammy while he watched the movie. According to Linda, Sammy whispered to her, I really dig that. When are you going to teach me how to do that? Huh? She uh, thought he was joking until he looked over at Chuck and asked if she thought he would mind. Oh. I know. That plot twist. I know. So Linda saw an opportunity here. She was like, mine? No, you go for that in a big way, but let me set it off for you. <laughs> oh, she's like, hell yeah, you can suck a stick, please. She knew that Chuck, in fact, would not go for this. In fact, he was kind of a homophobe. So she went over to him and unzipped his pants, and she was like, well, you can't just sit there. <laughs> and Chuck was, like, really into the movie, and I guess was just, like, Urgh. just, like, leaned back and let her open his zipper, and, like, didn't pay any attention. But Linda actually unzipped his pants, but then Sammy was the one to kneel down in front of him. <laughs> it took about a minute or two before Chuck realized that something was different. <laughs> So this is a quote from the book, Ordeal. It says, Then, although Chuck didn't utter a sound, his eyes were screaming for help. He looked back at me, boiling mad now, and with his right hand gestured for me to come over and free him. I just shrugged my shoulders and laughed. Did he beat her for that? I don't think so. Good. I don't know. I don't think he did. I don't know if she even mentions it. But of all things. Actually, I think, she, <laughs> I think she does say something like, I know he's going to beat me, but it was worth it. You know? Yeah. I think she does say something like that. Chuck had this weird thing where he would not stand up to people in a position of power. And I guess he was too intimidated to say anything to Sammy Davis Jr. So he just let it go. He just (laughs) let it happen. And whenever Sammy showed signs of slowing down, Linda would give him more instructions and encouragement to keep going. (laughs) Ironically, she was giving him the same advice that Chuck had given her when he was teaching her how to beat throw. Oh my (laughs) God. She wrote, Chuck glared at me, but he didn't utter a word. He would put up with anything rather than risk losing the friendship of Sammy Davis Jr. <laughs> He's so pathetic, right? He's like, I want to be friends with you so bad, I will let you felatiate me. <laughs> oh my god, I'm glad he got a taste of his own medicine, though. You know, just one thing that he didn't consent to. I mean, not not that that's okay, but, you know, at least at least he kind of got a glimpse. Got a glimpse yeah, a taste medicine. of his own medicine. Yeah. Not that that's I, whatever. I, I wish think that it's on fine. anybody, you know. But <laughs> yeah. if it has to happen to somebody, let it happen to Chuck Trainer. Not long after this, Sammy decided to actually make love to Linda, effectively choosing her over his wife. <gasps> but this also ended up being the last time that Linda hooked up with him, because not long after this, she would actually leave this life. Oh. Fortunately, finally. Linda was offered a lot of different jobs, like I said, interviews and stuff, as well as performances, including a stage act where she would sing and dance. And she was really excited about this because she loved music. And that was also one thing that Chuck never let her do. He never let her listen to it because he knew it was something that made her happy. Like, he would find the weirdest ways to just, like, crush her soul. Like, she never got to do anything that she liked. She was just, like, in a prison. And then say she would have, like, a belt with, like, fringe on it that she just, like, found beautiful. And then he would, like, cut the fringe off of it. Oh. Yeah, you know, like, he was literally breaking her heart, like, every day. So music was another thing. So when she was invited to do this this show, she was really excited. But his partying was making it harder and harder for her to get to rehearsals on time. Because he would go out until, like, 4 in the morning, and she would have to go at, like, 9 a.m. to work. And whenever she did stand up to him and, like, just being like, I'm going to lose my work, you know? Like, I need to get to this job. It's important. 
he started intentionally making her miss rehearsals because he realized it was important to her. At one rehearsal, he actually hit her in front of everyone, and people really threatened to leave if, if that happened again. Or also, because she was having so many problems with, like, showing up on time or just missing rehearsals, they also threatened to leave for that. Because they were like, dude, we're investing a lot into this. Like, we're going to walk. Right. One day, um, Chuck showed up to rehearsal, and it was too early to pick her up. So Linda actually fought back, and she said, no, you can pick me up when it's over. And that's at 430 and, like, they yelled at each other for a bit, but, like, she stood her ground, and this time he actually left. And this production is one where people are acting like, people were scared, you know? But mm-hmm. Linda was, like, standing up for herself and was like, this is Linda's show, you know? Right. That day, he left, and she put her everything into that rehearsal. She put her heart and soul into it. And a backup dancer actually told her, you know, this is the first time I've ever seen you smile. And somebody else was like, you know what? I think this is the first time that you've actually been living. Right. You know? At the end of the rehearsal, it was just Linda and her dance coach, Joe. And she begged him to drop her off somewhere before Chuck came back. So he was scared, of course. He didn't want Chuck to find her. But she was like, please, take me. And like, I will never speak of this again. It never happened. So she asked him to take her to the Beverly Hills Hotel. And she checked in under the name Linda Hyatt. Shockingly, nobody recognized her. So she got to her room, she went in, shut the door behind her, and the whole time she worried if she was, like, being too trusting of of her dance coach, Joe, who was clearly terrified of of Chuck, you know? Right. But for now, she was safe. She's got a door with a lock, and, like, she's by herself. So she took a bath, and then she called the Linda Lovelace Enterprises, which was, like, a little corporation that Chuck put together. Mm -hmm. And fortunately... He didn't answer. The secretary answered. Her name is Dolores. And she was, like, whispering, like, speaking really low. And she told Linda that Chuck was going berserk, just calling every taxi company in town and all of Linda's um, co-stars, everybody she's working with, and nobody claimed to have seen her. So he was just losing his shit. And all of a sudden, Chuck took the phone from her hand and screamed, where the fuck are you? Where the fuck do you think you are? What do you think you're doing? Do you realize? And Linda was like... Chuck was losing his fucking mind. He had to postpone these meetings because he needed Linda to be there for, and they were, like, big money deals, but she didn't want to do them anymore. And he's, like, blowing up everybody's phone and, like, threatening to kill them and their families if they don't find her. Several people got court orders barring him from talking to them. Dolores actually proved to be a true ally. When Linda eventually told her where she was staying, Dolores convinced her to go to a different hotel because somebody was likely to recognize her at the Beverly Hills. Dolores also drew money from the company account for Linda and met up with her to give them to her and to hand her clothes and wigs and drove her to a new hotel and arranged for two bodyguards to watch over her 24 hours a day. Before long, though, Chuck got to those bodyguards and they were intimidated, so they decided that they wanted to live and they didn't want to help Linda anymore. Or they couldn't help Linda anymore. Chuck's threats got worse and worse, but Linda knew that if she went back to Chuck, this time he would kill her, for sure. That yeah. Would be punishment. She called the police and she told them the whole story. Chuck was now constantly looking for her with his revolver and his automatic rifle by his side. The police told her, "Lady, we can't get involved in domestic affairs." Are you serious? Then she called Sammy Davis Jr., hoping that he would give her some support. And what he said to her was, "Well, you got to do what you got to do. In other words, you're on your own." Yeah, basically. Thanks. Yeah, thanks for everything. He's like, sorry, I really want to suck him off again, so I can't help you. Eventually, Chuck stopped making threats and started calmly pleading with Linda, trying to fix things so that they could keep the deals coming. Linda was like, well, I want my own lawyer. And Chuck was like, absolutely fucking not. He went off saying that she is Mrs. Chuck Trainer, and the Mr. Chuck Trainer takes care of his wife. And the only reason that she would need her own lawyer for this is for a desert, uh, is for a divorce. And he truly doesn't feel that she has enough grounds to want a divorce. Oh, no. <laughs> Not no. one thing. No, you don't think so? <laughs> he really said that. He said, I think what you're doing is bullshit. I have not given you grounds to stop loving me. And you better not fucking act like I have, because I have not. Uh, I never loved you. He me. went on this long-ass rant, and she just stayed quiet and listened the whole time. He just went on and on and on. And then she hung up on him again. <laughs> That's the best. Like, mm-hmm. mm, I, don't, I have no energy to talk to you, so. 
Chuck hired Lou Perry's bodyguard. Lou Perry was one of the producers in, in Deep Throat. So this bodyguard's name was Vinny. And Vinny was kind of following Chuck around and, like, helping him threaten all these people. And when Linda found out, she actually went to Lou Perry and was like, why are you letting Chuck use your bodyguard? It turns out that Chuck told him that Linda was kidnapped and was being held against her will. So he needed a bodyguard to get her back. So when Lou found out the truth, he pulled Vinny back and everything stopped. Chuck stopped threatening people. Like, it all ended there. Huh. She stopped hearing from him. Which is kind of like a true testament to, like, when he started taking everybody away from her. But little by little, the more people that she met and actually, like, knew her, mm-hmm. like, more people were kind of getting on her side, listening to her story. You know? Right. Yeah. Just like that, Chuck stopped bothering her. And suddenly, Linda's attorney informed her that Chuck was ready to sign divorce papers. I wonder what happened. Like, was there a conversation between them and Chuck at some point? I think it was all through lawyers. But uh, what happened was Chuck was now preparing to marry somebody else. This was another porn star oh, who God. he was managing. And her name was Marilyn Chambers. She was like, she was kind of like the next Linda Lovelace. Like, literally. That, that's exactly why that's, I said No, it that's God. basically what happened. Um, was she young, too? Oh, okay, hold on. Linda did see Chuck again once in an elevator. She wasn't scared of him anymore. She found him as like this lonely, balding old man. And he said to her, just remember that I love you, and if you ever change your mind, I'll be there. No, thank you. So, um, I'll get back to Chuck and Marilyn in a second. Linda became close with a guy named David Winters, who was a choreographer who was working with on that, um, in that show. Mm -hmm. And then the two of them became lovers. Together, they made a movie called Linda Lovelace for President in 1976. Was it a porn movie? No, it wasn't. In fact, um, she had a really hard time finding legitimate acting work, so this was kind of, like, exciting for her. It was supposed to be, it's about, like, a, it's like a fictional telling of if Linda Lovelace was running for president and her campaign trail was, like, in the shape of, it was, like, in the map of in the shape of a penis in the United States. It was supposed to be, like, a sex comedy. Um, so David was the co-producer of this movie, and... Um, he and Linda were, like, in love by this point. They were together, and he was very, like, respectful of her problems. He understood. He was witness to everything that happened. And he always did, like, stand up for her and help her put her foot down. But during the movie, Linda Lovelace for President, there was kind of, like, a distance growing between them. And from the very beginning, Linda was up front that she would not appear nude and would not do any sex scenes, and he stuck up for her. But eventually, while on set, all of a sudden, somebody would be like, Okay, Linda, take your clothes off. Time for the sex scene. And she would look at David, and he would just shrug. So this was the beginning of the end for them. That was him letting her down, you know? I wonder why. The same thing. There was the money. Because um, another example would be oh. the book. She got offered the opportunity to write a book called Inside Linda Lovelace. Or no, I'm sorry. She got offered the opportunity to write a book called The Intimate Diary of Linda Lovelace. And she wanted to use this as an opportunity to get her story out and tell the truth about Chuck. Right. Unfortunately, the publishers didn't like that story. Oh. They complained that there wasn't enough sex. It wasn't like her last book, Inside Linda Lovelace. Which yeah, well, was I didn't very... fucking write it, so. Exactly. So they wanted to tell the story the readers wanted to hear rather than the one she wanted to tell. David Winters thought it over, and he told Linda that he thought that they should write a little bit of the truth at the time and then a little bit more and introduce things here and there. Otherwise, the world just wouldn't accept it, and they ultimately needed somebody to just open the book and read it. So David and another publisher who was a friend, or I'm sorry, so David and the publisher who was a friend named Mel Mandel, and he had also worked with them during and, and been present during a lot of the abuse, they wrote the story that the publishers wanted. And even though it's not an exactly accurate autobiography, it does start to show Chuck as a villain, unlike the first book. And this book had a knight in shining armor in David Winters. It's like every man, it's like they start so nice and then they fucking show themselves. Right. But in order to please the publishers, they had to also include a bunch of bullshit that didn't reflect the true Linda at all. Things like, with a tremendous thrust, he put that surging, gorgeous cock inside me. A pulsating jackhammer that kept driving, 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 plowing into me over and over. Unfortunately, it was like nobody wanted to see or hear anything about Linda unless it was Linda Lovelace, the porn star. Right. But the way these men write, man. Yeah, they're... (laughs) Like, like no woman okay. Ever, no woman talks like this, you know? One thing that really messes with me is that there's passages in the book where Linda sounds not just like a prude, but actually 
seems to be borderline shaming non-traditional relationships or kind of kink shaming. And to be honest, I don't know if I could exactly blame her considering that her relationship with sex and porn might not have been so bad if it weren't always rape. And maybe she can't separate some of those kinks from rape, you know? Right. And to her, I mean, being introduced to those kinks as like basically non-consenting, she probably thinks that most people that take part in that are probably not exactly she she didn't meet a single decent person in all this work you know even the people who fell in love with her always had you know their own their own uh agenda yeah exactly oh and not just that but kind of like how we were talking about whenever she would meet a celebrity or something and they'd be like hey i'm gonna shake your hand you know and although they were totally respectful and admired her she couldn't help but think now i know you watched the disgusting things i did under coercion and the threat of death you know? Right. So it's like every single man she met, she started thinking any single one of you could have a little bit of Chuck inside of you, you know, and which everyone that she has encountered has even the most normal people, even every doctor she went to, you know, yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. Everybody she came across was pretty much either a huge perv or really sadistic. So, so unfortunately Chuck and men like him who he surrounded himself with, that was all Linda knew. Mm-hmm. And it's hard to tell her that's not true, you know? Yeah. Especially because, I mean, it makes you think that everyone is just like that. Exactly. Like there's no safe place. Even, and that's the thing, David Winters would have in shining, shining armor, and then he's like, well, just take your clothes off, Linda, come on. Yeah. You know? Even though Don't she's worry. like, but this was supposed to be my last born, you know? Yeah. I thought you understood that, you know? You got me out of there. So anyway, um, Linda kept trying to become a serious actress, but it never really worked out because she wouldn't do things in the nude, and she wouldn't do sex acts. And producers would pro- constantly promise her that was fine, and then they would start making changes to the script. They'd be like, eh, it's just a little topless scene, and then it's just a little softcore sex scene, and then just one or two hardcore sex scenes, you know? Like, yeah, they would just a little razzle-dazzle. Like, exactly. After she agreed to do the job, they would start adding and changing the script. In 1976, Linda was chosen to play the title role in the erotic movie Forever Emmanuel, which... I don't know if it was, a, this is, it was described as an erotic movie, but I don't know if it was always that way, because according to Linda, the script for the film started out very sweet and romantic and beautiful, and then again, as time went on, things were being added to it, and what started as a romance scene turned into a topless scene, and, and so on, and then Linda started being like, I'm not doing that, like I told you I wouldn't do that, and then they actually took the role away from her, and they gave it to somebody else, somebody who was willing to do those things, uh, and they gave Linda a smaller role. So yeah, according to Linda, she got a smaller role because of this. You know, she wasn't willing to do those things. According to the producer, he said, Lovelace was very much on drugs at the time. She had already signed for the part when she avowed that, quote, God had changed her life. She refused to do any nudity and even objected to a statue of Venus de Milo on set because of its exposed breasts. She was replaced by French actress Annie Bell. So it's almost like she's just traumatized and doesn't want to have to deal with anything that happens. Right, to but that's why I'm so interested in, like, was it always an erotic film? Because I don't think she would have signed up for that, you know? Right. She's not going to sign up and be like, but I won't do any erotica, you know? Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, eventually, Linda did find a man that she would marry and have children with. She did find the one man who she trusted and could actually enjoy having sex with. In 1976, she married Larry Marciano. He was a cable installer who later owned a drywall business. He actually knew Linda from the old days, I think maybe from high school or something like that. So when he thought of Linda, he actually thought of Linda Borman, the woman he knew before she became Linda Lovelace. So Linda was exactly the kind of man she needed. He was the kind of man who firmly believed in defending his wife's honor, which turned out to be a full-time job as the the husband of Linda Lovelace. Oh, I'm sure. The silicone injections in Linda's breasts turned out to be really dangerous. The silicone didn't stay together. It separated and it started slipping around, and her breasts became lumpy and painful. She'd been to a couple doctors, and she was told that the disintegrating silicone could form a clot and kill her. Some of the doctors even told her that she needed to have her breasts removed immediately. But then, Linda found out that she was pregnant. And as it turns out, she was able to breastfeed her baby. Aww. So she just kind of took the risk with them. She, she kept her breast. But yeah, it worked out. Linda and Larry had two children, Dominic and Lindsay, born in 1977 and 1980. They ended up getting a divorce in 1996 after 25 years of marriage. 
She did kind of speak unfavorably of Larry in, since then, I believe in, in a book or an interview, but but since then they've said that the divorce was civil and they remained in contact until the end. In 1979, Linda did a polygraph exam, which I believe was at the suggestion of her editor for the book Ordeal. What was the polygraph for? It was just kind of to uh, solidify what they were saying, like the editor wanted to make sure it was true before publishing it. Mm -hmm. um, so during the, sec during the session, the test results supported the following allegations. That in 1971, Trainer forced Lovelace to have sex with five men for money. Anne pointed a gun at her and threatened to kill her if she refused. During her relationship with Trainer, she feared for her life if she tried to leave him. He would hypnotize her. He asked her to help him run the prostitution business, and when she refused, he hit her. He beat her the night before their wedding and during the filming of Deep Throat. After she left him, Trainer threatened to shoot her sister's son if she did not return. When out with other people, he would tell her not to speak, and she had to ask permission to use the toilet. And lastly, the movie Deep Throat made approximately $600 million, but Lovelace was only offered $1,200. However, she did not receive any money from the film as Chuck had kept it. Oh my god. So all of those were corroborated by the polygraph, which you know is, is not evidence, but it does say something. I think. So That's he made all evidence. of that money, but didn't give her any and also didn't spoil her or do anything. No, he didn't do anything. That's the thing. She, she wasn't a person. It was like she, she didn't exist. You know what I mean? Everything was her, like, you, all of her signatures and everything was him. That's why the last time he got so mad when all he needed, like, she didn't even need to sign anything. She just needed to be at the meeting while he signed. I'm just in awe that anyone can treat people like that. You can completely take away somebody's autonomy like that. Chuck Trainer did go on to marry Marilyn Chambers and manage her for a while. She didn't come out and say as much as Linda did. There was a Vanity Fair article where, um... Trainer said that he considered himself a country boy and that he could live far away from civilization and that if his woman said something he didn't like, he thought nothing of hitting her for it. He said that? Mm -hmm. oh. He said that was just the country boy in him. Oh, oh okay. Makes um, sense. Linda's allegations have been disputed since she's voiced them, but if you look at the, the DVD of Inside Deep Throat in the second commentary, one member of the production crew actually... He backed up Linda's allegations of the brutal beating that left the bruises all over her that you can actually see in Deep Throat. Um, this man said that he was in, in the motel room next to hers and he could hear him viciously beating her at night. And he's the only one out of everyone that heard it that said anything. I don't know if he's the only one, but his was not notable. Mm. I think, oh, oh no, no, I'm sorry. There are other people, and especially because they made a, a sequel, Deep Throat 2, and it was very, like, well known everybody was like nobody likes him he's kind of aggressive and uh maybe even the people that didn't witness it they'd be like oh i believe it you know i take linda's side on this you know yeah marilyn chambers actually ended up divorcing chuck trainer as well in 1986 linda testified before the attorney general's commission on pornography also called the Mies commission stating when you see the movie deep throat you were watching me being raped it is a crime that the movie is still showing there was a gun to my head the entire time in 1987, Linda had to undergo a liver transplant. She actually contracted hepatitis, hepatitis from the blood transfusion she received after her car accident in 1970. Oh, my God. Yeah. Whoa. Yeah, but she didn't die. She survived that. that but was does a, that mean that everyone that she slept with has hep hepatitis? I don't think so. Or is that blood? It's blood only. Probably needles. I think it's needles. Yeah, it was something to do with the blood transfusion. I think something was, like, mislabeled or mishandled or something. She, she got, like, dirty blood or something. Yeah, it sucks. Yeah. yeah, I think it's only transferable through, like... Uh, and yeah, so then she needed a, a, a liver transplant in 1987. Over the years, Linda has become an advocate against pornography. She traveled the lecture circuit on a crusade against pornography and spoke at colleges and met with prominent feminists. There's a whole thing called the feminist sex wars, which is basically, like, one side of feminists arguing that pornography is exploitative and harmful to women, while the other side is more about sexual revolution, and being empowered by sexual freedom. I think there's a fine line between the two. I think so. So, interesting. This is what I think. To me, I think towards more sexual freedom and women doing what they want and not always having to be degrading. In fact, and I mean, we see this often here in Vegas, 
men kind of make fools out of themselves with women sometimes. Like, they blow all their money to, to have women entertain them and sometimes humiliate them. And all the while, the woman really has all the power. Right. And I mean, same you know, with, like, um, a lot of not to like blast my clients but <laughs> have like sugar daddies and like mm-hmm. they send them money all the time and they just like hang ha, out yeah. go to dinner have sex exactly you could think of that as demeaning to the women but you could think of that as demeaning to the oh, man you know yeah, it's really exactly. easy for me to just be pretty you know yeah it's like there's there could it, it just depends on the dynamic like either the man has the power um or the woman has the power over the and, and i think it all goes back to like the woman having her own autonomy like if you want to be a woman and have like a big mansion where you charge men to come and get abused, you know, and it's just you making your money and everybody's consenting. Cool. But it's kind of like, I mean, here in Vegas, you're not in Vegas, but in Nevada where we have brothels, like, um, I lived in Pahrump for a little bit and, um, I heard this from somebody who worked, who used to work as a nurse and she had apparently done like the pap smears and the STD tests on the woman from the brothels. Right. And they're not like slaves, but, If they're going to go to the doctor, they all go out as a group, like, in a shuttle, like a field trip. Or, like, say, for example, that it was just one of these sex workers who needed to go shopping or go to, like, an appointment or something. They would, like, give her the money and have the driver drop them off and, like, wait outside for her to be done and take her home. Like, they didn't, they couldn't just, like, go out and leave and stuff. They had to, like, schedule everything and get permission. And that's so weird. And that's legal, you know? Like, because it's like you have a boss and that's part of the contract and everything. But it's like... I feel like a big problem of it is when you have a man in charge, you know? Like, I mean, I guess you could put it in the same way as, like, a woman if you have a madam who's in charge. But I think that's the whole thing. It's like, yeah, you're my boss, but this is my body. Right. You know, how can somebody else be in charge of that, you know? Yeah, it gives me hands made still. Uh, oh, my gosh. I only saw, like, the first season, but, uh, yes. Oh, my God, I love that show. It's like, uh, I cry every time I watch it. I know, I just, I, I don't know, it's too, like, icky for me. Yeah. But um, an- another one we have to talk about is uh, Heidi Fleiss, who was a, uh, do you know who Heidi Fleiss is? She was also in um, Celebrity Rehab. She was a, uh, she was a madam. Like, she, but it was like, she was setting up all the celebrities with hookers, and it was like, I'm not doing anything wrong, and like, I, I don't know the story really well, I want to learn about it, you know? Yeah. Like, was she a good madam, you know? Right. Or was or she, she like, like a like sex slave? I am gay. Or not slave, but a sex master. Slave. Slaver, slavist, <laughs> slavey. No, that's not. Anyway, um, so here's something that Chuck Trainer said about Linda when uh, he said she was better at housework and cooking than sex. She was a lousy lover. When I first dated her, she was so shy it shocked her to be seen in the nude by a man. And that last part was actually true. And this whole this says so much more about him than it does about her. Yeah, it does she wanted to be a like, oh, she was such a prude. She wasn't good at it, and it's like, and yet. And yet, here you are, fucking taking all her money, you know? Yeah, exactly. On April 3rd, 2002, Linda was involved in another car accident. She suffered massive trauma and internal injuries. On April 22nd, 2002, she was taken off of life support and died in Denver, Colorado at the age of 53. Oh my god. Her two children and her ex-husband, Larry, were there with her at the hospital when she died. Larry said... Everyone might know her as something else, but we knew her as mom and as Linda. We divorced five years ago, but she was still my best friend. Oh. Chuck Trainer died at the age of 64 of a heart attack in California on July 22nd, 2002, just three months after Linda died. Three months to the day. That's interesting. That is really interesting. Maybe she came back to haunt him and, like, it scared the shit she out of him. His heart. Like, this she is mine. Just, she just I'm crushed it. This. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, I bet. Linda's sister, Barbara, later said in an interview that she was disappointed that Chuck died before she could kill him herself. I bet the mom was like, oh, he was a good guy. I wonder, in the movie Lovelace, they show her, like, seeing Linda giving an interview talking about it and she's just crying like oh what have I done and it's like I really hope so man yeah revel in it bitch <sighs> this is another sorry just to end things off this is uh, let me let me word the sentence word here's it. another quote from ordeal just to finish this off every now and then I'll pick up a newspaper and see that a new x-rated movie is opening and it stars Linda Lovelace don't ever believe it all that means is that they're including a scene from Deep Throat yeah, they do that. They're just, yeah. Whoa. 
What? And she says that they've done that multiple times. They just like reuse old footage and they'll call it like a new movie. So whenever you, after she gave up on porn, there were still movies that came out starring Linda Lovelace. Like, I'm doing Air Bunnies. Can she not sue them? Like, I don't know because she she consented to that being filmed. You know. Oh fuck. At the time, anyway. Right. So, I mean, I'm sure she's done everything she could. You know, she keeps telling. She told the court like. You people shouldn't be allowed to watch this. All right, so that's it for the episode. Um, like I said, if you want to watch a dramatized, dramatized, a dramatized, <laughs> dramatized, <laughs> dramatized, <laughs> if you want to watch a dramatized um, version movie of this, <laughs> um, there is a movie called Lovelace. It's starring Amanda Seyfried, and um, uh, what is the guy's name who plays Chuck? Pete Sarsgaard. Does that sound right? Possibly. All right. Well, he's playing Chuck, and uh, it's, it was really freaking good. Of course, it's fictional, so um, you got to remember there's a lot of it's it's shortened it's a lot, but, uh, but I thought it was really really cool to, especially to see like how the kind of grooming occurs. You know, like the the how the whole persuasion happened, and like yeah, just, just to kind of see it firsthand. You know, that it, it, people think it's that easy, and maybe it's not. Um, or so also, like I said, my book source was Ordeal by Linda Lovelace. I will warn you, this book is, um, it has some outdated terminology and a few slurs. Remember that the story takes place in the 70s and she wrote it in late 70s, it came out in 1980. On one hand, maybe these words weren't infamously offensive back then, but on the other hand, you can also sense from her energy that her views on sex were kind of destroyed before, before she even had a chance to develop them and explore them. Like, when I said she sounded kind of sex shamey, I, I truly disagree with what she says, but it also kind of sounds like a trauma response. Um, she also uses the word, um, she uses, like, a slur for homosexual people. And the way she feels towards them kind of swings from negative to positive, and I think that speaks a lot about people in the 70s. Yeah. It's like when Chuck was homophobic and she would meet uh, a gay man, she'd be like, oh, he seems like a lovely person. But then later on, she's like, well, they made me have sex with fags. And it's like, well, maybe they weren't quote unquote fags until you were forced to do things with them. You know? Right. Like they then were they were before that. But now maybe in her head, it's just she can never see men again. She can never see gay people again. She can never see anything other than fucking normal ass missionary. Right. As normal anymore, you know. So anyway, that is the story of Linda Lovelace. I know that was like a big roller coaster, but I, I hope you enjoyed um, I know this was like a crazy story to come back from after such a long break. Yeah, well, I think it was overdue. I think it was overdue. <laughs> I mean, this is one of those that a lot of people probably don't know the name, but maybe more people should. Yeah, it's really, I think it's really important to like have people, because I didn't know about, mm -hmm. you know, I knew about Deep Throat and Deeper Throat, but I had no idea that she was being raped. And basically. that's the thing. People know of her for because she's they're like, oh yeah, she's really good at sucking dick. Like that's yeah. all people knew and nobody knew any of this. And and I think it also is really good to open up that conversation about feminism and and sex because I'm very sex positive, you know. I'm mm -hmm. very you do you and enjoy yourself, you know. But I can also see this whole I'm anti neutral. Yeah. <laughs> if you want to you, you yeah, do it. Whatever. Do you, boo? But yeah, if you don't want to then That's a great way to put it. Which, which is like I don't think she has the opportunity to feel that anymore. You know, like maybe right. she did when she was 20 before all this happened. Mm -hmm. Um uh, I was going to say one more thing about sex positive. The 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 exploitation thing. The whole thing where like you are a product to all these men who are directing, you know, and but I mean, I have my own feelings on like actors as well, that it's like they sign on to, to, to the creative freedom of the director who can change things on the whim. And it's like, that, that's kind of abusive, you know, that's kind of taking advantage of them to just creatively change what they do like that, you know? Yeah. I mean, you have, there, there has to be boundaries and there has to be consent and trust. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, I, I trust your decision-making skills. So yeah, I'll, I agree. I'll give you creative. And I think they should be able to pull back that consent at any moment without necessarily like going back on their contract. Right. You know? Exactly. I think they should have some kind of like security net there. And I think that goes for anybody who works in a career with their bodies, like actors, athletes, you know, people who have to put their body through risks and then they're mm. con like their bosses are constantly asking more of them. You right. know what I mean? Yeah. I feel like they should be able to pull just like a, who was it? The gymnast that just had that whole thing. Simone Biles. Is that her name? I'm not, I don't know that story, but I have heard of like, you know, young girls that are in 
gymnastics and things like that. And their trainers push them so hard that they, you know, they're not eating and they're not menstruating. And, you know, like it's just putting people through all of this physical pain. It's physical and mental and it's not okay. Well, let me see what it was that happened. I think she even had like her doctor was like, yeah, don't do it. And they were trying to get her to do it anyway. Oh, okay. So here's the thing with Simone Miles. She was experiencing something called the, the twisties, which I guess when you're a gymnast, it like, it makes you lose awareness of where you are in the air while you're performing a twist. Oh. So it's like, yeah, it's like you lose like your, your peripheral or like your sense of space, you know, so it right. can be really dangerous. Um, so she was experiencing this and she was like, this isn't the first time this was happen- happening. And she knew that she had to like back out. And she was, like, getting a lot of pressure to do it anyway. And it could have been, like, really, really dangerous. And she could have landed on her head instead of her feet. That's what I'm saying. Like, it's not just, oh, she might not land right. She could kill herself. You know what I mean? Right. Like, this is her. And even if it's not that, even if she's like, what if I don't want to fucking sprain my ankle? Like, this is my career. You know what I mean? Like, sorry, I'll do it next year. You know? Yeah. Anyway, um, I want to talk about, there's a lot of cases like that. There's also a WWF wrestler. And, um, oh, God. I'll go into it later. But he fucking just, like, snapped one day and, like, murdered his wife and son before he killed himself. Yeah. And then it turned out, like, way later they studied his brain and he had, like, frontal lobe damage or something because of fucking being hit in the head. And, like, like Aaron Hernandez? Is that oh, that's, that's a whole fucking other one. See? This is this is something we're going to talk about. Because people, we, we're not machines. You can't just, like, fucking rebuild us, you know? Right. You can't just, like, charge us and we're better, you know? Yeah. We, we can only hit our head so many times before we have frontal lobe damage. <laughs> and we kill somebody. Yeah, and then that's the thing. Like, think about, like, when they were, like, talking about him on the news. They're like, oh, he died. And they're like, they're like, oh, poor thing, he died. Wait a second. He murdered his wife and son. And they had to, like, pull it from the news. Like, oh, fuck. Oh. Yeah, because they were like, wait, what happened, you know? They're like, RIP. And they're like, oh, shit. He's a murderer. Oh, right? you know. And we had to find out later what happened. So, anyway, that's a whole other conversation. Uh, hopefully, you guys stick through us with that. Um, I appreciate you if you're back after my long break. Um, but I appreciate... Oh, um, uh, hold on. Let me say that again. Me? I do. I appreciate Summer. I appreciate Summer for being here. This was fun. I'll bring her back soon, um, especially for the, to talk about Playboy and stuff. So that's it, guys. Um, thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. Um, as always, remember to check out brokenlimelight.com for updates and additional information on each episode. Um, I will upload photos, interviews, merch, shit like that. Um, cool shit like that. Also, you can always leave me a review on iTunes or Apple Podcasts or on brokenlimelight.com. Or if you'd like, send me money for beer at buymeacoffee.com slash US. And I'll use it to take summer out. Hell yeah. Okay, guys. Thanks again. Bye. Bye. I heard another term for mansplaining. Mansplaining, and it was... um. Correct bowel dysfunction? <laughs> yeah, correct bowel dysfunction. <laughs> Are we about to watch porn together? <laughs> Whoops. She's saying sorry. Oh, 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 sorry. Sorry, y'all. <laughs> Didn't so, mean to bump uh, ya. He actually knew Linda. I said that really. He actually knew Linda. <laughs> and just to go off on a little fucking rant, um, there's a lot of people who talk about, like, ever since Holly Madison started speaking out, they've said things like, oh, well, these women consented to this. And it's like, okay, so even if they consent to being a Playboy bunny and being a model 24-7 and doing these films, does that mean that they're consenting to just being abused and right. getting having sex whenever they don't feel like it? You know what I mean? Like, Yeah. And not only that, but, like, I feel like if anybody knows how unsanitary these are, it would be fucking Holly Madison, you know? <laughs> I don't even want to See, I don't even know that. anything that happened. Uh-huh. Well, this guy's having people have... Okay, so... We'll get to it. <laughs> Sorry, we'll talk about Playboy another time. <laughs> bark box, bark box, bark box, bark box. You guys know my dogs, Jude and Eleanor Rigby. Well, we just started getting in bark box, and I'm telling you, your dogs will love you. No more are they angry at the mailman. No more, I say. It's like a box of dog joy that's delivered every month, and each box tells a different story with different themed toys, treats, and photo-worthy props. Typically, what we get in each box is a couple of toys, a couple of treats, and a chew, but you can actually tailor fit your box to fit your dog's needs. Guys, I'm telling you, your dogs will love you, even more than they already do. So try it out, and if you use my link, you'll get a free extra month of BarkBox, which is a $35 value. So just head to BarkBox.com slash Broken Limelight and get started on your first BarkBox today. Bark-
Nailed it, Jude. 